Uh, I'm, I'm Navi Pele, and the full name is Navi Needham Pele. I'm from South Africa, and I was elected to, the, to serve as a judge on the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in 1995. And for the first four years, I was a trial judge, and for the following four years, I was the president of the tribunal. Could you describe for me what you walked into here in 1995? What was... What kind of shape was the ICTR in? Uh... We were we, we we met in the Hague, uh, six judges and the uh, five judges from the appeals chamber, and we drafted the regulations. And that's when we met each other. We we couldn't the English speakers couldn't converse with the French speakers. That's uh, Laiti Kama, whom we elected as our first president, and. So we were really kind of getting to know each other and our systems. Uh, I had already served almost 29 years as a lawyer in South Africa, very versed in the common law system. And when we got home, the registrar called me and said, you are the nearest judge, can you come and hear the first um, indictment hearing? So I paid my own effort, uh, so this is a strange situation. They elected the judges, but there's no courtroom. They didn't put the judges in office, but some, you know, if we don't begin with the indictments and wait for a building to come up, we'll probably lose one or two years. And this is what I thought, so I got onto the plane. So you asked me how I felt. Absolutely strange, because I was very reluctant to leave my country. We've just achieved democracy and wanted to be right there. But President Mandela had nominated me to the UN, and this was South Africa's re-entry into the UN. This is South Africa's first nomination to the UN. And so I was told later that it was unanimous, all 15 members of the Security Council and every African state. Uh, so in other words, I had the highest votes. Uh, and it didn't disturb them that I was a woman. But So I do believe it was because of South Africa, Mandela. There were huge expectations from South Africans. People told me that when I was serving here, we, uh, we like you, South Africans, because you work hard and you have integrity. So that's the expectations of other people. I came reluctantly, and I was really shocked to see how rural this is. I came from a big city. That's the first shock. And then the propeller-driven plane was the other shock and the roads were not tarred from the airport, and there was no courtroom. So the, the building where the court was eventually housed, the AICC, were, uh, there was still negotiations to get that building. But the uh, registrar at that time, Mr. Adeda, had opened a little office here. I was at the hotel, and that's where I held the first hearing. And I had to call Judge Goldstone, because he was prosecutor, and Judge Goldstone is my senior in South Africa. And here I'm the judge, he's the prosecutor, and he had to provide me with certain answers to the indictment hearing. So very interesting. Uh, the registrar found somebody who thinks she could type, so she started typing the indictment. And every change we made, then she had to retype that whole page. Uh, so all that are little shocks about where you're going to work, what kind of support you're going to get. But the important thing was that the indictment was issued. Uh, the registrar made a little wooden stamp in one of the little shops in Arusha. We came here to this building so we can be very clear that it was done at the issued at the seat of the court. So that's my first experience. I had a great deal of apprehension. I didn't know whether this place was safe. I heard there was a camp of 4,000 Rwandan um, refugees, I don't know if you can call them refugees, they were mainly in Tahamwa who fled. And this was, pre was pretty close in Tanzania. Everything was bushy, there were no roads. I never left that hotel, I was nervous. And, and went back, and of course later I realized I'm not the closest judge to the tribunal. Why didn't they ask Judge Shakula, who was right here in Monza? So apparently they had driven 10 hours to take the, and took the indictment to him, and he declined to sign it because we were not in office yet, and he, he's not at the seat of the court. So he gave the 
kind of answers that judges usually give. So you either be very strict to the to the rule, what we call positive positivist judges, or you adopt the attitude that if I don't do this, there's going to be a delay in justice. If the prosecutor has investigated and identified suspects, to them it's very urgent that warrants of arrest be issued as soon as possible. And let me say that my colleague, uh, Judge uh, Leonard Aspergen from Sweden, did the same. Uh, he left Sweden, flew to Cameroon and held hearings in, in the prison there. Because the ICTY had been set up a year before us and the judges were all put in office, but they had no case. There was public criticism that the judges were being paid for doing nothing. And, the, and so the reaction was not to put the judges here in place until a trial had commenced. So it's of course a legal question when a trial commences. Uh, so for, I, I should say, looking back, that from the beginning I believed in international criminal justice, but believe that very much depends on the individuals who drive this. This is not only the judges, but the staff and the police and the investigators. Um, of course, we s I came in thinking I will resign after one year. Really? Yes, because I, as I said, wanted to experience democracy in South Africa. I uh, had aspirations to get onto the Constitutional Court in South Africa. But when I uh, heard the witnesses who said, we waited for this day to see justice being done. And when I wait, heard witnesses say, my seven children were killed, our old village was wiped out, all these people's bodies were thrown into the drain, then it does make you think that, you know, your own uh, concerns are, are, are pale into significance, insignificance compared to what they have suffered. So I served eight and a half years here. I spent just one year as, as things were beginning to close and I got a sense that, that there were a lot of people here, largely because it was, a, it was a good job and it was an interesting job and it was on the right side of history in, in, in many ways. But, but when I imagine that time when things were just starting, there must have been a strong sense of uh, idealism, perhaps, or, or like, like what motivated you to to leave South Africa when so much was going on and staying? Um, firstly, I come from South Africa. It's a lifetime of fighting injustice. So everyone there, all my colleagues, lawyers, students, knew what it is to do the right thing. You have to fight for justice. You have to make sacrifices. And my experience was nothing compared to other people. My husband had been detained. Uh, so what made me come out here? Mainly that I was given a responsibility. So it's not like I applied for the position, but once responsibility is thrust on you and there are expectations, uh, otherwise you must not take the job on. We started in small steps, you know. The first thing that I reported back home is how different these judges are. One would say, this is the right way to do this, and the other would say, you mean that's the way you do it in your national system. So you see the differences, and I wondered, can we ever have uh, a, a universal system between the common law, civil law, traditional laws, uh, and also the way these laws are practiced in various countries? In South Africa, we, uh, of course, were colonized by the British, so it's a British system of justice where you pay attention to the tiniest detail, and you keep to time. Everything is done by time. Uh, so the great deal of adaptation here, but the wonderful thing is how we judges soon realized we all uh, have the same end in mind. We may take different routes to get there. So that was my one fear, how are we going to work together with strange judges who haven't been trained in the system that I was. Yes, we overcame that because that was just process. But it was left to us to find solutions every step of the way. What kind of impact did it have hearing these stories day in and day out, the, the, the kinds of the, the violence and chaos that was the very stuff that occupied all of your professional mental space, mm. and then to have to be the, 
the voice of reason, the moral compass for all of that. Uh, did that change you over time? It was a diet of suffering that we were hearing day in and day out, each one worse than the other. You think you've heard the worst, then you hear horrendous acts of atrocities. Um, so you have nightmares over this, it stays with you, it still stays with me. I could still see the video footage where the at this roadblock the f people were forced to kneel and they were slowly um, macheted to death. Not even fast, not one quick blows, but the fellow bang the one, walk around, smoke, come back and do the others. I still have a picture of that and of course the bodies of headless babies flowing in the river. I remember in tri trial chamber one, uh, presiding judge, Judge Karma, said he cannot watch this video any longer. It has to stop. And that was the uh, an individual in the last throes of death. So it's being captured on video. Um, we saw a great deal of forensic evidence, bones and so on, and soon realized we actually didn't need that evidence. We convicted uh, persons without a single body being produced, as it were. And that's why this tribunal never put a figure on the, on the debts. We took hearsay evidence into account. Of course, we checked the reliability of this. So, for instance, we would say that the witnesses said 4,000 people were attacked in the Rotaganda case around that uh, school at uh, just at the point where the UN pulled out. So the UN had, so, uh, was all around the school and the Interham were, were waiting behind the UN lines. The UN received orders to pull out. And so then we see these vehicles, we see the footage, but we also have the Belgian lieutenant who came to tell us about this and how the people hiding in that school said, please don't leave us. You can see the killers all around us. Please don't leave us out. And they, were hung, they uh, hung on to the vehicles as they pulled off. It was the worst demonstration of failure on the part of the United Nations to show scaring instead of having a policy of getting out as fast as you can. And I mentioned this because years later as High Commissioner, we addressed that. So we reversed the policy that you stay and serve. Your policy should be how best to stay and serve rather than how best to pull out. Um, 4,000 people were killed, exactly as they feared. The interim came down the hills as soon as the UN pulled out. These are extremely disturbing, uh, but the individual you are on trial is one individual. You have to be, you have to be satisfied there's a link with these activities and him. So many, many, what I'm saying is in the national court, yeah, you would not easily accept that 4,000 were killed. You, you need the numbers, you want to see the bodies, you want the district surgeon there. Uh, this is international criminal justice, this is trying genocide, there are widespread systematic killings. We could not strictly uh, observe the, car, the ways of leading evidence that you'll find in a national court where one individual is charged for one murder. You know, and the family and witnesses come to say what happened. So, uh, as a judge, many changes. We learn to understand the culture and traditions of, the, of witnesses who would first say they saw it. Yes, they were there, and then you realize they were 800 kilometers away. They'd heard this. So we admitted hearsay evidence, which common law doesn't easily do because they feel it's unreliable. They must have first-hand evidence. But when almost all witnesses are killed, you have to look at the next best, but you have a judicial duty to ensure that it's credible, it's supported, corroborated. There are very many counts where we, were, we refused to accept the evidence there was one case in Akiasu, which is the most horrendous incident, and yet it's not in the judgment because that evidence just came out. It was not in the allegations. The prosecutor hadn't disclosed information about that. This is a school teacher's wife. Akiasu was chasing after that school teacher who was his co teacher in the school, and he was going door to door looking for the teacher. 
to have him killed, but he couldn't find him. So they picked up his wife, who was heavily pregnant, brought her to the Bureau Communal. And here a case is standing. And the um, Hutu killers under him then trampled her and kicked her and beat her so that she aborted in front of the crowd. So the witnesses described this to us. But as I said, we could not take that allegations into account because we're applying rules very strictly on how you would verify the facts. So really, if, if it's ultimately, whether it's international or national, it's a criminal court case. Some people did not understand that. They may have had political views. Some didn't have law degrees or practice in courts. Gradually, we did even had some judges like that. Uh, there were some who felt this is all about international law. You need expertise in international law. No, when it comes down to it, this is just a criminal court case and you need criminal court, court experience for that. Is there one case in particular that stands out in your mind as being particularly definitive or memorable? It so happens I served in, I was on the panel in all the mem memorable judgments during the time that I was here and I see the memorial erected at the uh, uh, Arusha Park today dedicated, uh, it's an ICTR dedication to the community of Arusha. So those are all my cases. The first one would be Kambanda, it's the first conviction of a Prime Minister. Now he pleaded guilty, so we couldn't really spell out the law and so on. So the next opportunity was Akiyasu. We're looking at genocide. It's never been defined for purposes of criminal prosecution before. Good teamwork on our part uh, on how to do that. We had no precedents. Nuremberg had only crimes against humanity. So no precedent, not enough detail in the Convention on Genocide that you will find in the ordinary criminal law statute, which guides your every step. Up to now, people are still confused about genocide. It is a special crime with a, a specific uh, intent. It has to be an intent to destroy uh, a national ethnic force, specified groups in whole or in part. Up to now, I'm asked if there's a killing of four people out there, the public will say, why aren't we speaking in terms of genocide? So it's so new, and yet this, the convention was there for so long. That really uh, entailed a, a great deal of thinking on the part of us three judges and our team. But what has become even more well-known is that it's not only the world's first decision on genocide, but the world's first decision prosecuting rape and sexual violence. And I gave a couple of interviews at the time, and I said that historically there's been a neglect of prosecution of sexual violence against women in conflict situations. And I even looked at some military manuals of big states like the United States. The women were offered to the soldiers as rewards. Nobody protected the women or saw it as a crime. And so women's NGOs were asking for years and years and years in the UN halls we want rape to be recognized as a war crime. And that's what they told me. So here we are fighting for so long, along comes a judge who pronounces it in a courtroom and it becomes law. Well, firstly, thanks to those very brave witnesses who provided the testimony, they ha there was nothing in it for them except to take the trouble to come and tell the court what they saw and heard. And then secondly, we had to overcome the obstacle that there was no commonly accepted definition of rape and sexual violence in international law. So what do you do? As judges, we're very used to all the precedents, people who've done this before. And so anything new is obviously a, a greater responsibility. So with some help, we created a definition, and that has been now carried into the Rome Statute. I know that two states in the U.S. have changed their laws because that is a gender-neutral definition. It's what happens to anyone, uh, an invasion of a person of a sexual nature under coercive circumstances. 
because we spelt out that definition, the ICTY was able to convict as rape the violence that was perpetrated against men and boys there. So that's a benefit of uh, what went on here. Those are two cases. And the third that created international headlines and still does, Akiesu I, uh, is still uh, raising headlines and tons of articles written about them. All over universities, they study that. But the media case is what we call the media case. Three individuals, one owning the Kangura Journal, one the radio station, uh, Mil Colleen. It was clear from the evidence, and, and of course one a politician who had his hand in both. What was clear from the evidence is that the propaganda of uh, hatred of the Tutsi would not have spread across the country as rapidly as it did had it not been for the messages from that radio station. So everybody listened to the radio. We saw footage, you can see them at the roadblocks with the radio. The radio was also used to tell them where you'll find Tutsi. They're coming your way, look for their small noses and break it. So that radio really played a, a position that uh, I, had not th I had not thought was possible before. They had so much power. And we convicted the Belgian journalist who worked on that radio station as well, because he was part, he collab collaborated in spreading that kind of message of killing. The defense counsel, who was from Washington, said to us, freedom of speech is on trial here, um, and not these individuals. So a lot of the law was to check freedom of speech, when you would prohibit it, when would you restrict speech. We said. Uh, firstly, the uh, person reporting it has to keep some distance from the utterance. That's European Court of Human Rights jurisdiction. There was a radio station, uh, and the case was Jelisic. And the radio uh, in Europe, Denmark, I think, had allowed this group to spew terrible anti-racist sentiments. And so he was convicted, the journalist. So, A, you have to keep a distance from the remarks. Two, there could be... Um, um, in, in, in historical references to these matters. Uh, and thirdly, it's not any speech, but even hate speech is criminal if it uh, incites violence, incites genocide, in, in our case. We looked at some uh, US cases. Even the Supreme Court ruled that cross-burning um, is prohibited speech. Now, you see what that court was doing is you have to look at it in the context. You burn across here, it's nothing, it means nothing to us. You burn across there in southern United States, well, it means a great deal because it spreads fear. All right, as for precedent, where do we find a precedent, something that has decided this before? And I contacted a, a professor in the U.S. who sent me a rather... Greasy. You remember the photocopies then were very slimy. Mm -hmm. She sent me a very slimy copy of uh, Schreiner's case in Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. So that was the only precedent we had. He had published a journal. And even though there was no direct link of what he's published to what happened, he was nevertheless convicted. So we found a precedent here, and clearly in Geneva, uh, situ the facts fitted uh, the way that crime should be defined. Uh, so that's the other case that I am pleased because it required a great deal of thought, uh, hard work. You could easily say, well, why do I have to decide this? I'm leaving this out. There isn't a precedent. Now, now it's a precedent for many. It did hit the main headlines all over the world. New York Times, Washington Post. Why? Because media was very, very concerned. Many people in Africa were concerned. You're now allowing really bad leaders to put, you know, to uh, put out their propaganda and suppress criticism and freedom of speech. But the judgment is very carefully worded. Nobody I know has copied that judgment to give a contrary interpretation. The uh, there are some professors in the United States who filed an amicus on, on appeal because they felt that, uh, uh, yes, I was a presiding judge there and Eric Mills there with me. Yes, they felt that we had gone too far. We should have just stayed with 
uh, direct provocation or incitement of violence rather than go further into hate speech uh, because that's the United States uh, judicial thinking. That's why they have many cases of uh, Nazi marches to, through Jewish villages and they said that's all right, that's free speech. They also objected when the Convention on Civil and Political Rights was adopted. Article 19 is all about protecting uh, free speech. Article 20 obliges states to limit that speech if it is harmful. There is particular language there. So the United States signed up to that convention but had a reservation on Article 20. So it's a position they adopted when the convention was passed. It's a position they adopted in respect of our case, the media case. They filed an amicus brief and the appeals chamber did not accept their argument. So when I think of the ICTR, I think of these as just lasting contributions to the jurisprudence. And nobody thought it's going to come out of Arusha. What about something about, like, is there, do you feel like there is justice for Rwanda? Yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's a very broad question, but... but I know, I guess... we should get him to answer that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can tell you about the criticisms of the tribunal that came from Rwanda. A, that they had 150,000 suspects in their prisons with, with no help no law, they, you know, all the judges were killed, and this was a well-funded trial, and that we had at the most at one point only uh, indicted or charged eight persons, so a lot of money to convict eight. Uh, they felt terribly aggrieved that there was nothing, no reparation for victims. And so justice, in my view, involves, includes reparation for victims. It's not only about uh, prosecution and penalty, against perpetrators. It's also about delivering justice to victims. If they suffered, they should be compensated. And the United Nations does have a declaration on the rights of victims, but did not include it in the statutes of these two ad hoc tribunals. The tribunal was set up just for one purpose, and that is to try individuals who allegedly committed these serious crimes within that one year. So crimes that took place before 1994, or subsequently, or maybe ongoing now, uh, have not been and could not be addressed by this tribunal. Um, the tribunal is criticized for only having put Hutu uh, Rwandans on trial and not a single Tutsi. I think successive prosecutors tried to investigate that section. And it was extremely challenging for them because, A, you, were, you needed the cooperation of the Rwandan authorities to have witnesses brought over for, here for the prosecutor to investigate in that country. Otherwise, it's the end of this tribunal. So it was difficult for prosecutors to get cooperation from the Rwandan authorities to try, say, uh, colleagues and comrades of President Kagame. He once told me in confidence, I went there as a president, and he said, of course he wanted to cooperate, and so he called one of his closest comrades and said that, you know, the uh, ICTR wants to investigate you. And he said that man pulled out his gun and killed himself on the carpet there in the president's office. And I was shaken by that too. So there's, there's many aspects one has to consider. Bottom line is that justice should apply equally and not selectively. And anyone who's alleged to have committed these various serious crimes should not be let off. There should be no impunity for these serious crimes. And yet I developed an understanding of how difficult it is to achieve that. The Gachacha courts that uh, Rwanda then held to address the situation of these 150,000 awaiting trials in their prison. I support it because the judges were elected, they, uh, they, they are grass courts, and really they devised the uh, solutions which were not always penalties, 
they were forgiveness and also, well, now we order you to help build the house of this victim, which I thought was good. The greatest criticism, however, is that all those judges in the Gachacha courts were Tutsi, and they were trying Hutu. It's the same pattern there as well. So nothing is perfect. These two ad hoc tribunals were, were the start, the beginning. The most stunning factor is that the Security Council set up uh, these judicial tribunals, that they f found that there would be a solution, a deterrent effect in, a st in going through the judicial procedure route. So that was very new. I think both tribunals have demonstrated that um, that is achievable. It's a reality, international criminal justice. And so we have the International Criminal Court, which is going through its teething problem now, shall I say. Uh, what do you mean by that? Problem. Well, their indictments uh, indict serving a uh, serving head of state, serving deputy head, um, and the um, indictment against um, Bashar from Sudan has never been uh, effected by any government, nor has the Security Council reacted to it. So that's a referral from the Security Council. The prosecutor investigates. The court issues this uh, warrant of arrest, and yet the Security Council does not follow up by getting state cooperation for the arrest. So that's a challenge, I mean. ICTR was very lucky in that we had such good people here, investigators, security, that and intelligence, that they found these people who were obviously deeply hidden, disguised somewhere, they found them, and the UN did the arresting. ICTY uh, was very fortunate. European countries found these individuals and brought them over to the ICTY. So easier there, challenge here, which we managed to overcome. ICC has greater challenges. They need the cooperation of all states because they're dealing with very serious crimes. The fact that they didn't put the judges into office immediately meant it, that it caused delays uh, a whole year. It's just some indictments were issued. But can you imagine if those individuals had been arrested? You need a judge here. The minute a person is uh, arrested. That was one obstacle. The other is that this building was very slowly done up. So we held a, the first hearing in a kind of a restaurant kind of room with green curtains, I remember. And then along comes security from New York, who know it all, don't they? So they bricked up all the windows in all our offices and these courtrooms that they built. Right on top was a small bit of ventilation, about five centimeters. And so we, it was so hot in those courtrooms. It was, it was unbearable. We had no air conditioning. And so we wrote letters after letters to the Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali, saying, please, can we have windows? And then we gave up after he didn't read our letters, but even the third letter. So I know that things are well established now. We have, uh, they have everything. That's what the judges describe in years to come. But it's when you're pioneering at that level, you have to be very resourceful. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to ask people to sit in those courtrooms without any fresh air. Um, we had no telephones, so the security used to use radios. So we were all at code names. I was Juliet for something. Did we judges know how to use those radios? No. So we would use it like a telephone. We would say, okay, this is Juliet four calling Juliet one, and then we'll say, uh, Lighty, you know, this case that we're talking about, and the whole tribunal would hear that, this confidential discussion. So we never knew that's what radio means. You have to talk in codes, and you don't say anything that the whole tribunal shouldn't hear. Um, uh, you know, we just grew to love Arusha. We just, we, we liked our, our premises and so on. I had many visitors, mainly ambassadors, and... They would come and they'd be shocked by the office. You're sitting in this office. You, you know, we have very nice judicial rooms in South Africa, for instance. So very tiny offices with no windows, as I said. 
uh, no telephones. So people really would say, I don't know how you can work here. We are so happy we're leaving after two weeks. And yet we all grew to love the place. We cared about the work. Um, and that's how it built up. So small steps, don't give up. Um, I told you we had no access to research. Look what we have today on computer at your fingertips. You get everything. Uh, everything was new to our legal advisors as well. They also had to learn to get on. They had to learn to research from here and get people's help. So those were the early start. It was not always funny. We had hum numerous breakdowns of the vehicles since the roads were muddy during the rains. And as someone said this morning, yeah, that's true. Twice I got off the car and helped to push the car out. Um, especially my elderly father used to be very concerned about my safety here. And I realized I should not be... Um, be light-hearted about this because it troubles people who care about you. The road to Nairobi, we had to go there frequently. I had to go to Nairobi to catch plane home or uh, if we couldn't get the direct flight to, to Amsterdam. And that road was very dangerous. So there's a strict rule that we can't travel on that road after 3 p.m. So really we were stuck at that one end and we had to go through this four-hour drive through the bush where there were numerous roads, uh, roadblocks. Somebody may have told you this already. One of our uh, managers was shot at his car. Fortunately, the bullet didn't hit him. It hit his car. Uh, my legal officer almost drove into uh, what he thought was a leopard leaping across. Uh, so this is not a uh, court in a European city. Um, but we came to love it. After a while, we'd look forward to come back, and many of the judges said so. And above all, you know, I've seen many, many academic articles when they speak about the Arusha ju jurisprudence. So we put Arusha on the map. And that's lasting. So that's why none of the early struggles uh, were true obstacles. We, 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 we overcame them somehow.